Hello, everyone, and welcome to Thunder Gold's Live Investment Summit today. I'm pleased to introduce their president and CEO, Wesley Hansen. Wes is going to review the latest from Thunder Gold and afterwards take some of your questions live. So remember that you can submit your questions using the Q&A panel found on the right-hand side of your screen at any time during today's presentation. And as always, this event is being recorded, so look out for it on 6.com as an on-demand recording in the coming days. But without further ado, Wes, I want to pass things over to you so that we can get started in full. All right. Thanks, Cameron. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for uh, uh, learning about one of the most exciting exploration opportunities I've ever had the uh, privilege of working on. And that is uh, Thunder Gold's Tower Mountain Asset, located in northwestern Ontario. Uh, I have always viewed the keys to success in the mining business of acquiring as acquiring the right project at the right time and building the right team to move that project forward. And Thunder Gold and Tower Mountain offer both of those, uh, or all three of those opportunities moving forward. Before we proceed much further, just our forward looking statements, which are standard. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. And we'll get into the meat of the matter. So, why Thunder Gold? Why invest in Thunder Gold? And uh, in specific uh, terms, why invest in our Thunder Gold uh, Tower Mountain property? So, there are eight key factors that we have to consider when we're looking at the uh, at the opportunity afforded by the Tower Mountain prop property. And first and foremost, and the one that caught my attention when I was introduced to this particular story is there's tier one discovery potential uh, at the Tower Mountain project. And what that means basically is there's an opportunity to explore and establish a resource in excess of 10 million ounces. Uh, and that resource would be capable of supporting a mining operation of greater than 500,000 ounces a year of annual gold production for a period of greater than 10 years. And those are the factors that establish a tier one opportunity. And tier one opportunities are the most sought, op sought after opportunities by major gold producers uh, in the world today. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little further later in the presentation. Uh, we see minimal or I see minimal technical, environmental and social risks associated with the, uh, with the Tower Mountain property. It's got a premium location. It's located in Ontario, which is uh, one of the top mining jurisdictions in the world. Uh, very minimal uh, permitting risk, very minimal um, licensing risk. Uh, the property is, uh, um, um, sorry, I'm just having trouble here. I'm gonna have to put my glasses on, my apologies. So there's geophysical surveys. This is another thing that caught my eye as I was going through the data set for uh, Tower Mountain and, and the geophysical surveys seem to ideally outline areas of prospective mineralization within the existing uh, historical drill data set. There's, uh, we did original uh, metallurgical test work this year after I joined the company and we established that recoveries of better than 90% are, are, are highly likely using standard direct cyanidation technology. Uh, it's a non-acid generating ore and probably a non-acid generating waste rock, um, largely because of the carbonate content in the surrounding host rocks. It's a low cost, high return investment opportunity because the, like many of the junior mining space today, they're, they're, the, we've taken our lumps in the market of late, but this actually provides investors such as yourselves with an ideal entry point uh, to acquire uh, an initial position in a property and a company that has tremendous growth potential. And I believe that's what uh, Thunder Gold offers, which is why I've been accumulating shares on the open market. Uh, uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to establish my shareholding position in, in Thunder Gold. Uh, I see going forward, very low cost expiration on a, on a cost per ounce basis, probably amongst the lowest and certainly in the industry in Canada. And uh, we're very fortunate to have a management on board with extensive experience in in both the mining industry, the mineral exploration uh, aspect of the mining industry, and over 120 years of geological expertise on our board. Our objective is really simple. We want to demonstrate that Tower Mountain offers the potential for a tier one gold discovery. And we plan to do that by doing good science and making sure that the work we do is uh, uh, conducted to the highest standards possible. So in terms of the company itself, we've currently got 167 million shares issued and outstanding. There's about 10 million options, uh, ranging in price from 5 cents to 15 cents, and approximately 36 million warrants. Uh, about 25 million of those warrants will be expiring in February, uh, likely unexercised, but perhaps, uh, 
perhaps we can generate some forward momentum in the stock price and get those uh, get hit that twenty cent uh, strike price for the uh, for the warrants. Uh, fully diluted, we're looking at about two hundred and twelve million shares issued and outstanding uh, as of the current um, situation. About fifteen percent of our shares are held by insiders. About twenty six percent by institutions, and the remainder is a retail shareholder base. And in the Treasury, we have three million uh, Canadian dollars, and that consists of about a uh, million and a half to, to two million dollars in hard dollars, and another million and a million dollars in change in flow through that we just raised uh, at the end of the year uh, to allow us to do some preliminary exploration, test some concepts that have been developed in the last six months. A little bit about myself: I'm president and CEO. I'm a professional geologist. I've worked in the mining industry for more than 40 years, I've, there's very few positions and, and jobs that I haven't held. Uh, uh, I started out my early career basically doing exploration work in northern Canada throughout uh, northern Manitoba, Ontario, Saskatchewan and, and uh, into Quebec and uh, uh, the Northwest Territories and into BC, working at a number of small high vein greenstone hosted gold deposits uh, that were operated by a number of junior mining companies. I then transitioned and uh, uh, got some uh, work experience in the large open pit mines in uh, in Nevada and the United States. And uh, eventually that led me to a position as a consulting geologist with Kilbourne SNC Lavalin, where I've got exposure to even larger mining projects around the world. I uh, worked for a number of years with Kinross and their technical services team, basically doing project evaluations and, and um, part of the uh, Kinross technical team that was responsible for the acquisitions of Parica 2 um, and uh, the merger, the three-way merger of TVX, Echo Bay, and, and Kinross. Um, the reconstruction of, or the restart of operations at La Coipa uh, in Chile. So a number of large tonnage, uh, low-grade open pit gold mining opportunities uh, associated with, uh, with Kinross. Um, then I was uh, did a small stint as president and CEO of uh, uh, Norant Resources with, in the Ring of Fire, and uh, transitioned from there to uh, um, chief operating officer of Unigold uh, in the Dominican Republic, another large tonnage low grade opportunity in the in the gold space. And here I am today. I was uh, I was moving happily towards retirement, but uh, when this opportunity came across my my desk, it was too good of an opportunity to pass. So I. Uh, I got involved with the uh, uh, the Thunder Gold team, and I'm happy to be on board. And I'm looking forward to what the future holds. Uh, also joining, uh, uh, also part of the team is David Speck, our Chief Financial Officer. Uh, David has over 35 years of capital markets experience, uh, focused mostly on retail sale, sales and and junior mining company financing and promotion. He completed his CFA degree in 1994. Our chairman is Dr. Elliot Strachan, owner and president of Strachan Developments, uh, who, are, who are leaders in terms of sustainable building and property development in the uh, greater Toronto area. Uh, recently, we've been joined by Bonnie Lynn de Bartok, who joined our team as a director. Bonnie Lynn is a, a globally recognized expert in the field of uh, uh, environmental, or particularly social governance, uh, which of course is a vital factor moving uh, any mining company or, or mining project forward. So she's bringing a lot of uh, expertise on our social uh, on our social um, license to operate in, in Northern Ontario. Warren Bates, a professional geologist. Uh, uh, he has over 40 years of experience like myself, again, with a number of different uh, large tonnage low grade deposits throughout Canada and Africa and, and Latin America. Uh, Dr. Scott Jobin Bevins, who's a longtime director of uh, Thunder Gold, he also brings over 30 years of experience in the mining sector and, and mineral exploration. He was, uh, of course, many of you might recognize Scott as the uh, former president of the uh, Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada. And finally, Charles Lees, who's uh, our last director, and he has over 30 years of experience as well, uh, largely as an officer and director of several uh, publicly traded junior mining companies. Uh, he uh, he was a founder and director of TVX Gold uh, and uh, has sat on a number of public company boards. So tier one targets, basically the uh, left-hand portion of this slide shows you the, the major gold deposit models that are, are favored by the industry today. Uh, on the far left, 
lower corner are the orogenic flow deposits. Um, those are followed by the reduced intrusion related deposits. The Carlin deposits sort of sit in the middle. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the Carlin type deposits sit there. Then you had your porphyry and epithermal, high sulfidation, low, low sulfidation and epithermal uh, deposits associated off of porphyry copper gold opportunities. And then, of course, VMS deposits and, and paleoplasters are one of the largest, but they're fairly, fairly rare. They're um, uh, basically a, a, a table that basically summarizes the number of tier one assets, which are those greater than 10 million ounces, is shown on the right hand side. Uh, there's about uh, in total a little over 100 known deposits of greater than 10 million ounces uh, in all those categories, but by far the more uh, dominant deposits are hosted in the um, uh, oxidized intrusion related category um, where you have 39 different deposits. Uh, on average, those deposits are quite large, uh, offering a resource or reserve in, in the range of 28 million ounces. This uh, information comes largely from the Barrick Gold database. Um, it was published in a paper called Models and Exploration Methods for Major Gold Deposits, which was published in 2007. We've probably added a couple of deposits uh, to that tally right now, but uh, the important thing here is that intrusion hosted mesozonal uh, type deposits, which sit here. Uh, you can see a, a series of sheeted veins in an intrusion and equigranular pluton uh, without going into too much uh, detail. Uh, this is one of the targets that may um, explain the deposits at uh, Tower Mountain. The other one is uh, a low sulfidation epithermal type target, which is closer to the surface. Uh, the, the simple answer here is we don't know what we have, but what we do have is a broad, low-grade disseminated gold deposit that's in, uh, not entirely drilled off by any stretch of the imagination. The um, gold mineralization surrounds what we call the Tower Mountain Intrusive, Intrusive Complex, or the TMIC, that's an alkalic intrusion uh, that is interpreted to be coeval or, or happens at the same time as the surrounding volcanic host rocks. There's not uh, age dating information. The limited age dating information that's available suggests similar age between the host volcanics and the intrusion that we believe introduced gold into both the intrusion um, itself and as well as into the surrounding host rocks. There's been no structural fabric occurred or observed to date at uh, Tower Mountain. Um, this is something that's typically common of uh, most uh, greenstone type deposits, which sit here in the orogenic category. Um, these are largely veins associated with shear zones and faults that are originating off of the uh, introduced intrusion at depth. Um, we don't see any of that as yet, but it could be just simply a situation that the uh, expiration to date just hasn't uh, come across that or, or target at that. So uh, particularly important is the fact that gold is the only metal of economic significance that's been logged at Tower Mountain so far, which sort of uh, takes it out. And, and the alteration that you see is not uh, classic of a porphyry copper gold type system, which which would be the logical place where it would kind of see Tower Mountain as uh, um, a, expressing itself in the geological models. So all of these observations that we've seen at Tower Mountain sort of suggest similarities to either low sulfidation epithermal or mesozonal intrusion related deposits. And the nice part about that is those are large, those have the opportunity to be quite large. They're not always large, but at least the opportunity is there. So that's one of the reasons why I was very excited to, uh, to focus in on Tower Mountain. In a nutshell, it looks like a donut. Uh, there's a central intrusion which is the Tower Mountain Intrusive Complex. You can see to the right, shown in purple. Uh, the expiration to date is represented by the bite that's taken out of the donut. And the opportunity is the surrounding perimeter around that alkalic host, that Tower Mountain Intrusive Complex. Uh, we see mineralization based on the uh, expiration that's been done to date. There are indications of mineralization from surface sampling surrounding the entire perimeter of the intrusion outward for a distance of over 500 meters. So lots of, uh, lots of opportunity for uh, increasing the uh, total resource of the project. Uh, in terms of, uh, you couldn't ask for a better location or access or infrastructure to this project. It's a two and a half hour uh, commute from the Toronto Pearson, uh, or not Toronto Pearson, 
the Toronto Island Airport. Sorry, uh, that's the preferred uh, that's the preferred departure point for uh, accessing the property from from the city of Toronto. It's about a two hour flight, and it's a thirty minute ride on paved highways to get to the property. The, the property itself uh, is about uh, close to 2,000 hectares in size. It's located immediately adjacent to the Trans-Canada Highway, which is Highway 17, which you see here running up on the right-hand side. The Canadian National Railroad transits the, the northern boundary of the property, and there's a Ontario hydropower that crosses the, uh, the western portion of the property. The property itself is comprised of uh, both patented and unpatented ground. Um, patented ground is a significant advantage and all of our uh, option agreements are in good standing um, and, and uh, we have good relationships with the owners. Uh, one nice important part to note about uh, Tower Mountain is there's no significant water uh, within the property boundary itself. There's a few small lakes, but in general, there's no major waterways or, or large lakes that are impacting our ability to conduct our exploration or, or future development of the project. Uh, as I noted, we're 50 kilometers from the city of Thunder Bay. Uh, Thunder Bay has a population of 115,000 people. Uh, perfect access, uh, year-round access, and all of this basically equates to the fact that unlike a lot of projects today, we don't have to be reliant on uh, helicopter or fixed-wing airport support. We don't have to have a a winter road or an all-season road built to the property to allow development of the property. So it's one of those rare opportunities in the mining space where the, the project's location actually works in favor of uh, continued exploration and development, eventual development of the project. Uh, large tonnage, low-grade metrics. I mean, this is a large tonnage, low-grade opportunity. There's, uh, there's no other way to put this. There's not... Uh, there, to date, at any rate, there's been no discoveries of significance in terms of high-grade vein hosted shear zone hosted mineralization that's typical throughout most Archean greenstone belts. But what we do see are several hundred meter intervals in drill hole, um, the drill holes that have been completed to date that average in somewhere between 0.3 and 1 gram per ton. Uh, if you look at most operating mines around the world today, especially the large tonnage low-grade open pit mines, uh, you're seeing average uh, cutoff grades used for the resource uh, resource estimation parameters of uh, around 0.4 grams per ton or slightly less, depending on the opportunity. Paracatu, where I was fortunate enough to work with Kinross, is the lowest grade gold mine in the world. It has an operating cutoff grade of 0.2 grams per ton. Uh, the black dots basically represent the... Uh, uh, the, the resource cutoff grade, so you have a reserve cutoff grade, which is what they target with their mining, but the resources are generally a little more optimistic and they have a slightly lower cutoff grade, probably in the range of between 0.3 and 0.2 and 0.3 grams per ton. Uh, all the mines shown, Detour, Malarctic, both, uh, both in Canada, both producing over 700,000 ounces a year uh, and currently current Canada's largest producers, both of those are... Uh, 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 very successful mines and, and something that uh, should be emulated elsewhere in Canada and that's kind of our mindset. Uh, Rainy River is uh, close by the property as well. Paracatu in Brazil, Round Mountain, Fort Knox in, uh, in Alaska, those are two American based mines. Those are all very successful large tonnage open pit gold mines all operating at similar cutoff grades. And in terms of Ontario based projects or Canadian based projects, what we see is uh, Detour Lake is uh, they have an established resource and reserve of 14 and a half million ounces. That's sort of the kingpin in the Canadian mining industry today. They produce 700,000 ounces of gold annually. The average grade in their uh, resource and reserve statements is uh, around 0.9 grams per ton on average. Um, I'm also shown other Canadian Ontario based operations, including Port Define, which is in Timmins, the Spring Pole project, which is currently be de being developed a couple of hundred north, a couple of hundred kilometers north of Tower Mountain. It averages uh, uh, around a gram per ton in terms of the average resource grade with about four million ounces defined to date. Greenstone, which is a couple of hundred kilometers to the uh, to the north of Thunder Bay as well, near Geraldton, that's currently being developed as well. It's a six million ounce resource, averaging slightly higher, around uh, just better than 1.25 grams per ton on average. But basically, the, the the opportunity here is to demonstrate that these large tonnage, low grade deposits are becoming increasingly common in Canada. 
they're transitioning from the United States and they offer significant value generation potential uh, for companies that are involved in the exploration and development of those assets. The reason I went through all of that is basically to demonstrate that Tower Gold offers a similar opportunity. At a 0.2 gram cutoff, which you can see here in the chart, the average grade of the Tower Mountain data set is currently 0.79 grams per ton of gold and represents about 30% of the drilled population of about 25,000 samples. Uh, what that suggests is a strip ratio in the range of 2.4 to 1, which is fairly similar to the operations that I demonstrated on slide 9. And, uh, as your cutoff grade goes up, what you see is your average grade increases of your resource and uh, or potential resource, I should say. And as your um, as your cutoff grade increases, the amount of material that's available uh, above that cutoff grade decreases. So your strip ratio theoretically would uh, increase as well. So at a 0.3 gram per ton cutoff, for example, we have a, a better uh, better than a one gram per ton average grade, which is equal to the the operating gold mines in the previous slide, uh, and it represents 20% of the total population of uh, drill results to date, which suggests a four to one strip ratio. So these theoretical grades and, and strip ratios uh, from the Tower Mountain data set are very consistent with operating mines and mines that are going into production currently in Canada and Ontario today. I mentioned at the onset, we have ex excellent expiration vectors and, and we're very fortunate in this particular project to have uh, two expiration vectors, uh, geophysical tools that uh, work to our benefit. The first is Airborne Mag, which perfectly maps the Tower Mountain intrusive complex and helps us focus in on this perimeter area. And the second is induced polarity and, and in particular chargeability responses within the induced polarity data set which uh, uh, it's the best match I've come across in terms of uh, IP data to date. And I, uh, uh, I like the results so much. Basically, we, uh, we spent money at the end of the year uh, basically to expand our IP coverage to these areas that are shown in crosshatch that don't have a colored background. So uh, this southern block, uh, this eastern block, and this northeastern block. Uh, we've completed the northeastern and eastern blocks and we're currently in the process of completing our IP survey coverage on the southern block as we speak and we're very excited to get those results back. Uh, what we know so far is that the Tower Mountain intrusion is a multi-phased alkalic intrusion which suggests a direct connection to the mantle. Uh, at least two phases of the Tower Mountain intrusion are gold bearing, possibly more. The mineralization discovered to date surrounds the, the, the intrusion itself, extending outward for up to 500 meters. You can see the 436 zone here is kind of the, the limit of our uh, uh, current mineralization through described through drilling. Uh, gold occurs both in the volcanics as well as in the alkaline intrusion, intrusions themselves. Uh, there's a very close correlation between pyrite content with the best pyrite, visually observed pyrite grades or, or visually observed pyrite observations correlating with the highest gold grades, which also uh, coincidentally correlate with the IP chargeability response that we're targeting uh, uh, with most of our drilling going forward. Alteration is very, um, very poorly developed, uh, which suggests either we're distal to a potential higher grade uh, mineralization type or higher gold grades. Um, largely the alteration that's been observed is uh, chloride epidote carbonate uh, which has been overprinted by hematite, which makes the, uh, the identification of the, uh, of the alteration very difficult with the core logging, but we've been making uh, headway on that particular front, and, and there's uh, different tools that we plan to Detroit deploy in the future to sort of clarify that. Uh, thin section analysis has indicated that there's no or very, very minimal penetrative fabric in any of the, uh, any of the samples that have been submitted to date. But most importantly, the highest chargeability responses that we see in the IP survey are largely undrilled. And if we go to the next slide, you can see an example of that at the bench deposit. Um, the IP survey from uh, 2022 basically highlighted uh, uh, a very high chargeability response, which I've highlighted here in red. Uh, all of our drilling largely um, does not penetrate that chargeability response. The, the drilling at the Ellen uh, target on the north overshot the chargeability, the higher 
the higher response chargeability anomaly and pulled some some very good values near surface in the uh, in the outer rim or the next layer out from the from the highest response. Same thing happened at the A target, uh, which is located here from the south, which sort of opens up the potential for this entire 500 meter strike length between the two as being perspective for additional mineralization. Uh, and the bench drilling itself largely rests in a, in a lower chargeability response, uh, again, on the fringe of the deposit. And where we did drill that high-grade chargeability or that high chargeability response in 2022, uh, it's where we happen to pull our highest grade results uh, uh, within the bench zone mineralization itself. So the next slide is going to be, a, a, you're going to see a view of that uh, chargeability response in section. And it'll show you the uh, the drilling and the results from that drilling in uh, uh, looking to the north. So you can see again the the same red outline represents the uh, the same chargeability response that you were looking at in the previous slide on surface. Now you're looking at it on a vertical plane uh, to the north, and you can see that there's a half dozen or four holes basically that penetrate at that higher grade response. And the results of those four holes are shown over here, highlighted in the in the darker colors on the table. So uh, hole 83818, which was drilled by uh, uh, INCO uh, in the 1990s, basically intersected 150 grams of 0.4. Uh, it's coming into the section, if you if you can imagine the drill hole is coming towards you. Uh, then the hole is 21106. Uh, it intersected at uh, um, 230, sorry, 58.5 meters at one gram per ton. Um, and we show that here in this area. Uh, hole 21, 120 intersected 150 meters at 0.8 grams per ton. 22, 134 intersected uh, 240 meters, averaging 0.5 grams per ton. And 135 pulled uh, 240 meters at 0.75 grams per ton. So you have these long, consistent intervals of low-grade mineralization with the assay values on an individual sample basis ranging from 0.1 to 1.5 grams per ton. There's very few uh, intercepts in the database of greater than 30 grams per ton, which, uh, which is a nice problem to have in some respects because it takes uh, concerns about variability or the nugget effect out of the equation when you're moving forward. Uh, I noted this is the, the section 57, uh, 7500. Uh, that section is sort of the southern end of that uh, IP chargeability response. And these sections are moving in 100, 100 meter increments as you move from right to, uh, or from left to right, and then move down. You see these increasing in 100 meter steps. And actually, very few drill holes penetrate that high chargeability response. So we have a we have a drill ready target ready to go today. And, uh, and, and as we complete our IP survey coverage around the remainder of the perimeter, we hope to identify further similar type responses that would also be targeted with future drill holes. I talked earlier about their uh, metallurgical sampling. We, we uh, collected representative samples from the existing historical data set, we submitted those for analysis and, and the analysis came back very favorable, very fast leach times, recoveries between 70 and 95%, uh, on average, 87% uh, on average between the 12 samples that were submitted. So uh, it basically indicates that the uh, mineralization is certainly amenable to direct cyanidation, which is a huge uh, benefit to know going forward. What we've completed in the last several months, uh, basically, we took the opportunity to collect our initial MET samples and, and get those analyzed. Uh, we completed a review of the geophysical data, which has been very telling. It's identified a number of opportunities. We've uh, reviewed uh, all of the uh, multi-element ICP data to see if, uh, if the uh, geochemistry supports the concept or can clarify the, the, the uh, whether or not this is a low sulfidation um, epithermal type deposit or, or um, uh, mesosonal um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank, intrusion-related deposit, my apologies. Uh, we've completed some verification sampling of the historical data just to make sure that the, uh, the historical uh, assaying was correct and it's uh, correctly transcribed into the database. Uh, we went back and corrected uh, six QA, QC failures from the 2021-2022 drill program just to, to make sure that uh, 
uh, when we get to a resource estimation stage that that, uh, that concern was eliminated. Uh, we submitted samples for petrographic work with uh, um, a group out of the university in, in the Ottawa region associated with the University of Ottawa. We're very anxious to get those results back. Uh, we submitted samples for whole rock geochemistry, again, trying to quantify between uh, low sulfidation epithermal and, and uh, uh, mesosonal intrusion related gold deposits. Uh, and we're doing, we're currently in the middle of completing uh, an additional four square kilometers of induced polarity survey coverage, which is being completed by Abitibi Geophysics. It's using their new DAS Vision 3D survey system, and we're, we're very anxious to get those results. Uh, we've already got drill targets, as I noted earlier, that uh, uh, very high chargeable responses and a, and a uh, very close correlation between high chargeability and, and uh, content and gold that, uh, that provides us with targets that are ready for immediate drilling. And we've recently completed a uh, $1 million Canadian flow through financing, uh, the funds of which will be directed solely towards uh, completing that exploration drilling going forward. Our six month plan basically is to complete the, uh, the IP survey and, and interpret that data and select targets with, uh, with a view to sort of starting a drill program towards the end of February or early in March. Uh, that program is probably gonna be in the range of 3,500 meters, possibly more. Um, but right now we're planning on about a 3,000 to 3,500 meter drill program, uh, specifically targeting high IP chargeability responses to, to demonstrate proof of concept in terms of the viability of IP as an exploration tool going forward. If that all works out, then the, the plan would be to expand that IP coverage to the remainder of the, the property, to mostly to the west uh, and, and to the south. Um, we're sort of bounded by the... Uh, by a township um, to the uh, to the east and to the north, but uh, you know uh, it's possible to move towns in Canada to build mines. I think that the Malarctic showed us that opportunity, and uh, hopefully have results uh, towards the end of May or early in June, and that will allow us to uh, um, develop additional exploration programs going forward to demonstrate value to our shareholders. So that's our focus point, and I uh, um, I'm certainly uh, um, just to reiterate, these are the uh, these are the main points of the presentation. There's tier one discovery potential. There's minimal economic, technical, and social risks associated with this project. It's got a great location in a in a world class mining jurisdiction, easily accessed, uh, year round road access, highway access. Geophysical uh, tools are available to us that highlight opportunities for in enhanced gold mineralization, uh, metallurgic. Uh, results don't seem to indicate any potential issues in terms of recovery. Um, we're currently undervalued. We're trading in the five to six cent range. So it's an excellent opportunity to buy low and sell high, which of course is the reason I'll, you're all joining us today. Uh, we see low expiration costs going forward, probably in the, in the lowest, uh, amongst the lowest expiration costs and uh, certainly in Canada going forward from this point. And uh, we have a very experienced board and management team focused on the uh, focused on a common objective, which is basically to demonstrate tier one discovery potential at Tower Mountain. Uh, this is just our contact details, and I encourage you at all, uh, anybody who wishes can uh, reach out to me. I'm more than happy to, to set up one on one meetings if that's something that you're interested in to go into greater detail. This is a high level introduction to the Thunder Gold and Tower Mountain story. Uh, and then the rest of it is, uh, is uh, basically uh, uh, background information that you can um, review at your leisure. So with that, I think we'll conclude the presentation and look to take, uh, take some questions. Absolutely, Wes. Really appreciate that great presentation. Uh, and I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that if you do have questions, please submit them in the Q&A chat on the right-hand side of your screen. But let's get started with questions that we received so far, Wes. Brittany wants to know how much drilling is planned for this year. Well, right now we're currently looking at a 3,500 meter drill program and that 3,500 meter drill program will be focused exclusively on testing uh, high chargeable IP responses uh, that are identified currently in our existing IP coverage and in the new IP coverage that we're currently uh, completing. All right, great. Augustine wants to know, what would be your best guess estimate that Thunder Gold is going to have an economical tier one find? Well, that's always, I mean, that's always difficult to say. I, all I can say is that uh, what I've seen so far basically would make this probably the most exciting exploration opportunity I've ever 
I've ever witnessed. I've worked at Round Mountain, which is a 10 million ounce discovery. I've worked at Fort Knox, which is another 10 million ounce discovery. Uh, Paracatu, which is the third 10 million ounce discovery. And the thing in common with all of those was basically they did systematic exploration to establish their resource and grow it uh, in, a, in a systematic manner. Uh, they relied on good science and they did uh, they did good work. So it's uh, uh, it's always an exercise in patience. Uh, again, I can't uh, you know you you don't come across these broad, uh, long, low grade intervals that that lack variability very often in the industry. So that was uh, that was an immediate uh, uh, point of interest when I started to review the Tower Mountain data set and, and agreed to get involved in the story. All right. Barry wants to know, um, so you opened up the presentation with saying that you've purchased shares on the open market, and he just wants to know how many shares do you currently own? I currently own uh, 1.3 million shares, 1.2 something and change. It's, uh, uh, it's a variable number of changes as, uh, as I find additional funds to be able to buy more. Fair enough. Uh, Brittany has another question. What do you finance through to? Well, currently we're fine. At, like we've got uh, over three million in the treasury. We're very fortunate. Uh, uh, we have a, a significant hard dollar balance, and we have a low hard dollar burn rate. So we can uh, we can we're certainly uh, uh, we certainly could deploy that money towards expiration, but it's far more efficient for us to uh, to basically look at uh, doing additional raises in the future as we demonstrate proof of concept to our expiration projects and, and take that to the market demonstrate to our shareholders and, and investors that, hey, we're, we're on to something big here. Uh, we're doing good science. We're pulling, we're, you know, we're, we're delivering on our promises and our objectives, and we want you to become part of our story. All right. Mary wants to know what similarities or differences would you expect to the cons consultation work with First Nations compared to your previous experience? The, uh, well, this, uh, this particular project, Tower Mountain, is on uh, the traditional territories of the First William, Fort William First Nations, sorry. Uh, uh, my limited uh, experience with uh, Fort William has, has been extremely positive. They're, uh, uh, they're a, uh, um, a forward-thinking um, First Nations group, and, and uh, uh, we've had very positive meetings with them thus far, and we plan to uh, certainly engage them going forward to... Uh, to make sure, first of all, that they're consultant, uh, they're consulted about our exploration activities and are aware of what we propose to do, and, and are in agreement with what we propose to do, uh, and hopefully bring them into the fold in, uh, in a greater uh, capacity moving forward. Uh, in terms of my previous experience, uh, I think uh, uh, I, that question may be referring to the NORAD experience in the in the Treaty Nine First Nations. Uh, uh, surrounding the Ring of Fire, and it's it's just a different. I think Fort William has a different mindset and see the benefit of resource development uh, uh, for their community members, and um, I'm I'm looking forward to working with them. All right, great. Paul wants to know what needs to happen to transform the market's perception uh, as yet another low grade wannabe PMG. Well, I think again, it's uh, it's doing good science and and telling the street what we plan to do, and then delivering on that promise and demonstrating the potential of the asset. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of low grade wannabes out there. That's true, uh, but all you can do is drill holes and speak through the drill bit and demonstrate the quality of your asset, uh, and deliver on your promises. And, and I think in this particular instance, unlike a lot of lower grade uh, opportunities that are out there, we're right beside a highway. We're 50 kilometers away from population center. Um, takes me two and a half hours to get to the project site from Toronto. Uh, those are opportunities that a lot of other people don't have. And, and that basically means that for every dollar you raise, you get to put more, more, uh, more a higher percentage of that dollar into the ground because your cost base is lower. You don't have to fly goods or materials or people or food or any of that stuff into a remote site. You don't have to build the expensive all season road. You don't have to build a, a winter road. So there's there's tremendous benefits uh, packed to this project that should lead you down the path towards discovery in the future. All right. Len wants to know, are there any anticipated obstacles or concerns in 2023 for Tower Mountain? And if so, what are they and how are you gonna navigate them? Well, right now I haven't identified any obstacles. I mean, we're 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 delivering on our objectives in terms of uh, we wanted to demonstrate that the 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 uh, uh, 
mineralization was amenable to direct cyanidation. So now we know uh, kind of a, in a ballpark or we have the goalposts to, to sort of put a recovery number on, on the gold mineralization. We now know that IP is a very viable and, and perhaps a predictive expiration tool. Uh, our next step uh, after expanding our IP coverage is to pick the best targets, drill the holes, send them in for analysis and see what the results tell us. And that'll that'll dictate our next step in the process. And, and it could be we uh, uh, we stumble across something big. It could be we identify something that changes the whole story and either uh, improves the opportunity or or, or uh, just lets us know that we're on the right path. All right, then. Do you want to build, joint venture, or sell the property? And if so, what determines those decisions? Well, I think all of those decisions are, are basically dictated by your current uh, your, your your current knowledge and the current uh, state of the markets and the opportunities that are out there for you. So, I think at this stage, all options are on the table. Um, I'm not one of the reasons why I got involved with Thunder Gold is I, I I'm kind of uh, I've built a few mines in my life and and uh, that's. Uh, that's something I don't want to do as I uh, sort of near retirement age. It's a, it's a tough job. It's a demanding job. Um, building mines is a, a, an extremely difficult undertaking in today's world. Uh, finding them is a lot more fun and, and a lot more enjoyable. And uh, that's my focus going forward is let's, uh, let's define a resource that would capture not just the attention of the investing public, such as yourselves, but also potentially the interest of majors, uh, major gold producers, and, and that opens up a whole new avenue of opportunity for our shareholders. Right. It's kind of in today's uh, summit's title, but what do you mean by low drama mining? Well, the nice thing about, uh, like a lot of people, a lot of investors in particular, they, they, they tend to measure their investment opportunities based on the grades that are coming out of the drill bits. And, and you know, like, let's be real. There's something about 15 or 20 or 25 grams per ton over four or five or six meters. That's just captivating, uh, especially if you've got some visible gold thrown in there that, uh, that that people just don't get to see. Like people, if you can't see it, it's not real, right? So like the low grade opportunities, uh, they're, you know, they're far more valuable. That, uh, that table that I presented of tier one gold projects by various class of, uh, of uh, model, various expiration model, all of those are open pits. Very few of those are underground mines, if, if any. Uh, I didn't get into the specifics on a project by project basis, but you know, you've got to remember that uh, uh, that portal, you can't, you can't conceivably make an underground portable portal big enough to get your production up over 500, 600,000 ounces a year. You just don't see that. Whereas uh, you, you do have that ability in an open pit mine to get up in the 500, 600, 700,000 ounces a year of production. And you, all you got to do is look at Canada's two largest gold producers, which are Detour and Mal Arctic, and you see that right away. No, fair enough. Mary wants to know how are advances in robotics and technology going to be applied in the work on this project? You know, what, what's new in mining that might be applied to impact results here? That's uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, the short answer is there's all kinds of advancements in mining, and we're currently deploying one. Uh, the IP survey that's being conducted by Additivi is is their DAS Vision True 3D IP survey. Uh, IP traditionally was done in a series of regularly spaced sections using cut lines. This particular survey system did not require cut lines, which is one of the reasons we chose it. It's a true three-dimensional rendering of the uh, IP chargeability and resistivity responses uh, under the subsurface, and we feel that gives us a superior product. Uh, there's significant advancements in terms of scanning technology and XREF uh, uh, analysis machines, which would clarify a lot of the geochemical signatures and allow us to identify the the, the, the breakpoints in, in, you know, perhaps different phases of alteration that we cannot see by eye. I, I will be totally honest here and say this is one of the first projects in my entire career that I haven't been able to walk on site and within a couple of days be able to point at a particular rock and say that's a work or that's waste. And, and that irritates me. <laughs> but but the reason why is there's such a significant overprint of uh, 
hematite alteration that impacts the volcanics in particular that that obscures everything that you would see visually even even the sulfide content is in, in places difficult to distinguish it's very fine uh you know and, and all of those things uh, are detriments but they're also uh, they're also benefits as well because uh, it allows you to deploy uh, new technology that perhaps isn't widely in use and, and answer some of those questions so that's something we're certainly going to be uh, looking at going forward particularly the use of uh, uh, x-ref analysis to to basically clarify our alteration and lithological breakdown very cool Nikita wants to know, what did you mean when you said that you can move a town to build a mine? Oh, uh, that was a reference to Malarctic, of course, because Malarctic was a gigantic open pit that uh, there was an existing town site that had to be moved in order to allow that pit to be developed. So it's uh, there's presidents. It's uh, it's uh, it's in Quebec, but uh, there is presidents. This uh, I don't think that uh, moving a town is in the cards. Uh, certainly not at this stage in the game. But uh, I just threw it out there as uh, it's not. It's not a significant hurdle that has to be overcome. Fair enough. You you've talked uh, just a, a couple minutes ago about the you know benefits of the location, two and a half hours outside of Toronto. But Mary wants to know why a gold mine in Canada compared to any other country. Uh, personally, having worked all over the world, there is absolutely no country I would prefer to work in more than Canada. It's it's uh, you've got surety of title. You have a, a legal system that understands uh, uh, you know. Uh, mineral title and, and mineral uh, exploration. You've got every province is consistently ranked in in the top mining jurisdictions in the world in terms of investment attractiveness. Um, you know, like uh, if you're working in other countries of the world, you're you're often at the mercy of governments that perhaps uh, might be at odds with your uh, your particular goals and objectives to drive shareholder value and uh, uh, for your shareholders. I don't think that exists in Canada. I think uh, I think Canada is an established resource culture, and there's a lot of there's a lot of positive things to be said about that. Absolutely, Mark wants to know how many drills do you plan on having on site this year? Well, our current program with the uh, 3,500 meters would probably be a single drill, and uh, I'm probably going to be the guy that's going to get to log the core and take. Uh, uh, take care of that single drill program simply because uh, I want to see what's going on firsthand. Get my hands dirty and and uh, try to understand uh, the opportunity better uh, myself. Okay, fair enough. Jared uh, says this. He notices that all the drilling is in the alteration halo in the volcanics and tufts. Are those trachytes or rhyolites? The intrusive appears to be relatively barren. The uh, well, that's largely because the intrusive itself is not well drilled off. What we see is a, a series of um, uh, what we call them dikes and sills, which are extru uh, expressions originating or emanating from the main intrusion itself. Uh, typically, our highest grade mineralization is located in or immediately adjacent to those sills and dikes. Uh, and, and that's all in the volcanic sequence itself. The volcanics itself are. You know, we've we've taken the term, uh, we, we've just differentiated them at this stage as volcanic uh, uh, trachytes or, or andesites or uh, andesitic breccias, for lack of a better term, and, and the breccia is very coarse. Um, the, the mineralization sort of uh, tends to uh, fill fractures and, and uh, fracture filling uh, within the breccia itself and, and as disseminations within the uh, intrusive rocks and the volcanics. Everything, everything is more or less the same age. So it was a rather dynamic geological setting that we're still trying to piece together. But uh, uh, the the short answer to that is more drilling and more testing. Absolutely. Um, Barry wants to know if you have any updates on the African properties. Uh, certainly, I can provide an update uh, on the African properties. Uh, uh, the Okahanga project we have it to our. Uh, to a company, Iron Bull Resources, and they're currently uh, acquiring a public listing and, and driving that particular project forward. Uh, we've uh, transferred title of the uh, ex exclusive prospecting license for Okahanga to them, and their plan, their short-term short plan is basically, uh, uh, they're, they're currently in the process of drilling and, and from all reports are having some success with their drill program and their uh, uh, their short-term plan is basically to look at uh, completing a pre-feasibility study using their um, African-based consultants 
to drive that project forward and get to commercial production on a short time frame uh, to position themselves to be able to sell copper um, within the next few years. And that's very exciting for us because we maintain a 1% NSR on that and would generate uh, pro generate revenue from the potential cash flow offered by uh, the sale of copper from the Okahonga project. In addition to the fact that once they receive their public listing, uh, we're due another payment uh, uh, in shares of uh, approximately 1 million US. So uh, we wish them nothing but the greatest success. They seem to have assembled a great team uh, in in the country. Uh, they've got a very good and viable plan to move that project forward. And uh, we're looking forward to being a long-term happy shareholder. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Brian wants to know if you could speak to any other exploration and or mining activity for that matter in the vicinity of Tower Mountain. Oh, sure. And I neglected to highlight that during my presentation. So I'll apologize to that. Uh, look, the sh we're located, the uh, Tower Mountain is located at the uh, eastern end of the Shabandawan Greenstone Belt, which extends for over 100 kilometers. Uh, the Shabandawan Greenstone Belt hosts a number of other companies uh, uh, that are actively exploring and looking for gold. And, and uh, those include, and, and I, I, I'm not going to attempt to get them all right. So if I miss anybody, my apologies, but Kessel Run Resources is one. Uh, um, Gold Shore Resources, of course, is another. They've got a 4 million ounce resource and, and are generating some extremely positive results from their property, which is about 60 kilometers further to the west. Uh, we've actually vended some claims into uh, Gold Shore's exploration asset. So, so they're uh, a partner or we're a partner in their opportunities as well. So I think the Shabandawan district itself offers great potential. It's, uh, it's long been ignored simply because you never saw the type of... Uh, Red Lake high grade, um, you know, high grade gold discovery potential in the uh, Shabandawan belt that you've seen around the Red Lake district. So as a result, it just simply didn't seem to say, see the same level of uh, exploration. And that's why the opportunity, uh, an opportunity such as, thund as Thunder Gold exists today is because of that, uh, that lower grade tenor. All right. Well, fair enough. Listen, Wes, we've had a lot of questions come in. That looks like a uh it's it for now so i want to thank you for coming on as well as everyone in the audience for joining us today especially everyone who contributed to the q a with your questions but before we wrap up i want to pass things back to you wes just for some closing remarks if you have any for the group sure uh again i i express the same sentiment thanks everybody for uh coming to join us today and learning a little bit about thunder gold and our exciting tower mountain project uh we look forward to uh, delivering on our promises in the first half of 2023 and uh, we'll be providing you with un, uh, continuous updates using the six platform going forward. And, and uh, we look forward to sharing our good news with you all. Uh, anybody, I encourage you to reach out by uh, email or, or we can set up a private meeting if you want to learn more and go into greater detail. This was a very high level summary and, and uh, uh, probably, uh, probably leaves many of you with more questions than answers. So I'm happy to, to address those questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis at your convenience. And uh, Wish you all well and uh, all the best in 2023. All right. Well, Wes, thank you again. And everyone in the audience, thank you again. I hope you both have a good rest of your day. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.